الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى عليه وصحبه وسلم أما بعد as was requested by my habib uh, to talk about how I a little bit about my story about uh, accepting Islam and I was given a list of questions and we'll try to answer them and give them as much right as possible first question what is your name nationality and background my name is Khalid Green uh, the name I was born with, my mother gave me, is Craig Green. Uh, I'm from Seattle, Washington. That's where I was born. I'm African American. And, uh, of course, that means uh, I'm from the United States. I grew up in a place called, uh, predominantly, after I leaving Seattle, in a suburb, in a place called Bellevue, Washington, for those who are familiar with Washington State. The second question, when did you first uh, accept Islam and what was the reason for your conversion? Well, for me, it was a process and it was really through academics. So for me, initially, uh, I accepted Islam, I think it was around 1993. At this time, I was, prior to that, I was really soul searching, searching for who I am as a person. Uh, and I initially began with looking into the nation of Islam, mainly because of the influence of Malcolm X and how that book, reading his, his autobiography, changed my life and changed my outlook on many things and even who I was as a black man in America, among other things. And so I loved his integrity and that attracted me immensely and his discipline. So I began... Uh, going to meetings of the Nation of Islam, but I didn't find what I was looking for there. And the racism that was there. So there's a difference between nationalism and, you know, being proud of your race and things like this. But what I saw there was the racism, meaning that uh, to preach black superiority, that never sat with me. I never, I never, I couldn't agree with uh, any superior order, whether it was white over black or black over white, and that necessitated in their Akita hatred. Also, a lot of the stories of their Akita, so it just didn't sit with me. I wasn't getting the spiritual uh, juice I was searching for. And at that time, I was also, I was a musician, and in fact, not a musician, I was a, a singer and a rapper and a screamer uh, in many different groups, and the group that I was in at the time, I was seeking. So I, so I was used to, to a greater or lesser extent, being the front man in the group, and being in front of the public. Not that I was very comfortable with that, but I was, I was used to it. I'd had many uh, experiences in being in performing in uh, venues and doing some mild, mild tra traveling around Washington State and. And as far as Portland, Oregon, to do shows and so on and so forth. So uh, I had a song at that time called Soul Searching. And basically the lyrics, of course, I wrote all my own lyrics, um, was, you know, I'm soul searching to find myself. Something, something changed my mind and something, something. Anyhow, so I was on a mission. I was actually going through a process of soul searching, you know, who, who I am, what, what should I be doing? What's the purpose of life? And I wasn't an unhappy person. I was into self-help and I was looking at all the various religious traditions. I was reading, going back to the Bible because I was raised in the church. I was uh, um, looking at mm, Bo uh, Buddhism and I was even Hinduism. I was reading the Bhagavad Gita and things like this finding a little spirituality in each of these traditions, but only Islam, when I got the Qur'an, the uh, translation was the only thing that seemed practical. Some of those other faiths seemed like going up in the mountain and wishing world peace and world peace would come about. But Islam was practical, especially with the Salat. So I had a friend who uh, I grew up with and was in the first rap group, I guess if you want to call it that, back in the days of breakdancing, that we used to be in a group together. And he had actually moved to Canada and he 
come back and he his girlfriend uh, was a Ismaili, you know, Aga Khani or something like this. And so he told me, he said, buy the Quran and put it in your car for good luck. Well, for me, I didn't want the good luck. I just wanted to read it, actually. So I bought it and I read it. And I, was, I read it through and I was trying to make Salat. I remember going to visit him and I was already trying to implement some of the positive aspects of discipline. I was trying to, you know, uh, of course I was deep into music and loved hip hop and loved all these and jazz and everything and punk rock and hardcore and pretty much all kind of music. And so I was on this path anyhow. And I found that Islam, you know, in the exalting of Tawheed and the practicality of prayer, that this, uh, you know, had something for me. Also, while being in the university, I also found that, uh, you know, I had courses about, uh, I took courses about Africa, uh, you know, as a continent and the various nations and colonialism in Africa, but also how the Muslims impacted uh, many nations in Africa. And also I took a class on the history of China and another course on the history of India. And so I was also, you know, exposed to how the Muslims, the Mughal Empire and different things that really fascinated me. And I was going through this whole process all at one time. And then I, to make it as short as possible, I became Muslim eventually uh, in the masjid and so forth. Uh, so the reason for my conversion was the love of Tawheed because I and, and I was soul searching and I uh, uh, and, and the practicality of prayer. When did you think it was important to seek Islamic knowledge of your newly adopted religion? Uh, that was a long time into my Islam before I even thought about seeking knowledge because where I grew up in Seattle, we didn't, you know, at that time there wasn't a large immigrant community. The Somalis were j beginning to come when I was a Muslim. So we had other Masajid, we had some Arab communities and, and uh, Pakistani and Indian communities as well that were already kind of established. But the community of the greater Seattle area or Washington state was still kind of small, though we had several Masajid. Then we had a, a large Cambodian community as well, Cham uh, Masjid, and that's where I took my Shahada, and so we didn't have anyone to really teach us. Some of the people who went out from our community to go and seek knowledge, a brother Abdubari, who's well known uh, in his Dawah efforts with the Maghribi Institute, and also Sheikh Farid, and some others, we have a lot of Tulab al in the Seattle area, who, from that same generation, more or less, who went out to seek knowledge. For me, it took a long time before I uh, had an interest in knowledge. The first books that we read were Said Qutb and also a book by Jamil Alameen because we are a community that I function with. They, most of the people had bayat to Jamil Alameen. I did not, but they had bayat and uh, there are many war stories out of that, but that's outside of our scope. Uh, and so um, I didn't, begin to think it was important to seek knowledge until I got the chance to maybe do my master's degree. I finished my bachelor's more or less and I went to visit a, a good brother of mine who traveled to the East Coast and he went to New Jersey to the community of Abu Muslima. And you know that was the first time of me seeing really a, a student of knowledge and someone you know we were just so, you know the people were at awe at the things he was doing and, and, you know, and I was just so surprised coming from Seattle, Washington, you know, all these, especially to see indigenous Muslims, African Americans, big beards, short thobes, niqabs, you know, I was just amazed by the outer appearance and that began to incite or instill in me a need to learn more about my dean and to become more serious about my dean. And a lot of interesting stories out of that. But however, uh, I recall uh, some of the brothers were going to go to Yemen. And at that time, I was trying to get a visa to Sudan. And my passport at that time, I had dreadlocks. My dreadlocks used to be on my shoulders. And that was something I used to be very proud of. <laughs> uh, 
And so my first few years in Islam, I had dreads on my shoulders. And no one could tell me to cut those dreads. But then eventually, as I matured in my Islam, I one day, you know, cut my dreads off. And I recall that, uh, you know, the experience with Abu Muslim's community that instilled with me the want and the desire to go abroad and seek knowledge and to go to Yemen as other people were going, were going to Yemen. Uh, what motivated you? So my first experience in seeking knowledge was actually once I got my ticket, I got a one-way ticket and I didn't know anybody really. And I had some directions. I didn't. I, I could read and write a little bit of Arabic. I learned that in my community from a Palestinian brother. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him. And also a, a, a brother, Abdul Nasser from Sudan, taught me to read Quran as well. And others that helped me to still instill a foundation. And so from that, uh, I just got up and I went to Yemen. And I happened to run into some British brothers. And at that time, I ran into Hassan Somali soon thereafter. And he was good friends with a good fr who later became a good friend of mine. Um, Ali Clark al Comptony, Rahmatullah Ali Rahmatin Wasiya. So I ran into those guys and they were telling me to go to Damaj. And I had already had instructions to go to Damaj. And I had to meet up with some brothers, Abdullah McPhee, some other brothers who later stayed in Damaj, mashallah, many years. So I went to Damaj and that's when I began to uh, learn more about Islam and learn uh, more of the Arabic language. But I didn't stay very long. Um, so that's when I first started seeking knowledge. Then I ended up actually having a lot of time away. I had to go back to America. I ran out of money, went to the UAE for a little bit. And I ran out of money, got married, went to... Went back to the States and then it was uh, the reality of being, <laughs> you know, out of the system and not having money and not studying enough to be able to really go to books, uh, not having enough Arabic because, and that's one thing why I try to stress the importance of being of inkita, of, you know, continuing uh, uh, seeking knowledge and not taking a break, especially when it comes to sciences like uh, learning the Arabic language. The next question, um, do you remember what, where, what were the first books you started studying when you started seeking Islamic knowledge? Well, those were the Medina books and the Arabic, and also, um, I th believe, some of the books, uh, Asul al Falatha, I believe, and Arba'in al um those were some of the first books that I began to, to, to kind of study a bit and study with some students of knowledge. Uh, were these books important in developing your knowledge of Islam? Uh, yes, very important, you know, very important because of the emphasis on Aqidah. Then I went back to Yemen. I kept going back and forth and I would study more grammar, studied in Aden for a while. And that's when I actually probably had enough Arabic. I, you know, had a student of knowledge, one of the local imams there. Anwar al Adros, half of the Allah Ta'ala, I hope he's okay with all the fitna that's went and taken place in Yemen. And those beloved brothers in Yemen, and I could just tell you so many countless stories of the beauty that I found in Yemen. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, Iman Yemen, Yemeni wa Hikma Yemeniya. Iman is a faith is Yemeni and uh, wisdom is, is Yemeni. And so anyhow. Uh, those were some of the first books, and he took the time. Also, my beloved brother, Adil Ubadi, and I hope that he's okay. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve him. Also, <clears throat> he used to sit with me, and that was the first fiqh book. I began to actually go with him. He sat, gave me a you know personal darse. We'd sit, and we'd read, and he would explain to me uh, and break down for me um, uh, Imam Shokani's book, uh, Rolda Nadia, or uh, uh, I forget the name of the, the book. And so we would, you know, that was my first real exposure to really any thick, and I was loving it. And he, you know, sat with me. And so those books really had a great impact on me. Uh, but really taking my Talib al M to another level was coming to Saudi. Firstly, I went to Hail Saudi. My Arabic was better. 
but it still wasn't strong enough to where I could understand 100% of what was being taught. But my Sheikh, Sheikh Saeed bin Halal, that helped me. The Sheikh, you know, let me be the reader for Shara Sunnah by Imam Babahari with the Saudis and others. And that put pressure on me and it helped me to improve my reading and it helped me to improve my understanding. And so, and the Sheikh was just all about Durus, you know, you know, there was just constant Durus, even though he was reading books way over my head, I would be in those Durus. Sunan Tirmidhi, we were studying, we were studying Barbahari, I was, you know, reading for, um, you know, he had other things in Fiqh, Beluga Moran, we were studying, uh, we, st and, you know, the Book of Fara'id, and that was really hard, you know, in, in, for me, in Beluga Moran, but all those books helped to shape me. Also, then, at night, he would read from Atlam al Muwaqi'in, so, which is a major book in Asul of Fiqh. And, and other sciences, I don't know what, you know, what to, how to describe that book of uh, Ibn al-Qayyim. Um, and, you know, I would just try to pick up what I could, and that all helped to shape me. Then I would say I was learning, I was getting stronger, and we were going through books, and it was fantastic. Then I went to Medina. My workplace changed, I went to Medina, and it just went to a whole nother level. And the amount of durus to be able to sit with all of those scholars... Uh, and also do some formal Arabic programs too to clean up my Arabic more. And um, so the next question is, uh, have you learned Islamic knowledge from rel religious scholars? Yes. Uh, and so that goes back to, uh, also in Hail there was Sheikh Aidi Shemri and Sheikh Abdullah Ubeilan. But when I got to Medina, uh, there were so many Mashaikh and I sat quite a bit with Sheikh uh Yani with Sheikh uh Abdul Masan Imam Abdul Masan al Abad. I used to say with Sheikh Saleh al Abud for Tafsir after Fajr sometimes. Uh, I sat with a little bit uh, Sheikh Ali Nasser Faqih a little bit Sheikh Saleh Suhaimi a lot of Dorat with the Sheikh Sheikh Ibrahim Rahali was pretty much a daily part of my diet and doing books with him and Sheikh Suleiman Rahali as much uh, as well as much as he taught and he also lived very close to where I live so then I could corner him and get questions in uh, Sheikh Ubaid uh, Jabri I used to go sit and do some books with him Sheikh um, you know and then many Mashaikh during the Dorad it would be Sheikh Muhammad bin Hadi it would be Sheikh uh, Sheikh uh, you know just so many Mashaikh, Sheikh Abdullah Bukhari a little bit, Sheikh, Abdu, uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Hadi a little bit. I would sometimes try to catch Durus with him. Some of the other scholars uh, that I spent significant time, those are probably Sheikh Mohammed Aqil. I would, you know, and did sometimes if I had questions, I would just go visit him, pray in his masjid, try to catch him, maybe go to his house. Sheikh, um, and then some other Mashaikh, Sheikh uh, Ahmed uh, uh, Sheikh Ahmed uh, Olamistan. Yeah, many different uh, Mashaikh, Sheikh Abdul Razak as well, of course, and mainly in Dorat. Uh, and so that was a lot of experience with some of the scholars. Um, which field of the Islamic sciences should a speaker of knowledge start with and why? Uh, or, I'm sorry, uh, many questions and I'm missing them. Let's go back. Uh... Were these books important in developing your knowledge? What was the first Islamic science you studied? Fiqh, Aqidah, Tafsir. I would say I spent most time, most of the time emphasizing books and Aqidah because that was kind of what was put before me. And that's what, you know, we thought was most important. It is most important, of course, getting your Aqidah. But I do kind of wish I would have been much more well round, uh, grounded and well rounded. And that's why studying programs, and that Allah favored me to do Dorat there in Medina, but also in Jeddah, those things, I graduated from the uh, Institute of Studying the uh, the Quran and Sunnah in Jeddah, which was a two-year Sharia program. That immensely helped my Talib al-Ilm, you know, really take it to another level. As well as I went back and forth, I went back to Yemen again, went to Dara Hadith in um, Hadramaut, sat with, sat with Sheikh uh, Abdullah Mar'i, immensely benefited from the Sheikh. 
and other mashayikh in Yemen. And, you know, and then I came back to Medina and, you know, continued studying. So books of Aqidah was first and foremost, sorry to ramble, try to be a little more on point. Uh, as far as the first Islamic science, so I said Aqidah, those other programs and, and, and sitting in other durus with Sheikh Suleiman al we got more fiqh, that was his thing. Um, and Sheikh Abdul Masin al Abad, Hadith, um, and others. I also, towards the end, I would try to sit with Sheikh, and also while I was in Jeddah, uh, Imam, uh, who's one of the Kibar al Ulama in, in the committee of Kibar al Ulama, is Sheikh, uh, 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 Sheikh uh, Mukhtar Shanqiti, half of Allah Ta'ala, and others. Um, did this lay a found, solid foundation for further study in Islam? Yes, it did, absolutely. Which field of Islamic science would, should a seeker of knowledge start with and why? I believe they should start with Aqidah, with creed, and also the basic fiqh that can help them practice their religion. Uh, and that, that's why, you know, because the Aqidah is the key to paradise, you know, knowing Tawheed, and being grounded in the science of Tawheed, and, uh, you know, learning the fiqh of ibadat, you know, fiqh of, uh, of worship, things like uh, tahara and salat and zakat for the one who has wealth and hajj for the one who's able to make hajj and som f uh, fasting and uh, so forth. Those are very important to have us, uh, you know, to be solid uh, and be exposed to that knowledge. Have you learned Islamic knowledge from religious scholars? We mentioned that. What benefits did you gain from learning Islamic knowledge from the religious scholars? Uh, just to be brief, I would say by being in person with the scholars compared to listening to tapes, uh, you learn the tarbiyah. You learn, for example, one of the most powerful things that I remember about Sheikh Abdul Masin al abad I remember once he was asked a question, and I think it was during Sunan Tirmidhi, and it was a question about uh, breaking your wudu, I think uh, maybe about the Luhum al-Ibl, you know, does a, a, a camel's, uh, eating camel meat break your wudu? I think it was that, or or maybe it was Mesa Vekir, or, or rubbing your private parts. Anyway, and I thought that I knew because from my studies. I was like, yeah, th this. And the sheikh hesitated, and then he said, Wallahu alam. To hear an alam rubbani, who knows? To say, an Allah knows best, that's humbling. And that, and that shows you the tawadah. And it shows thik fideen. It shows uh, um, understanding of the religion. And hikmah and wisdom to, to give the students that tarbiyah. That you, you don't have to answer every question. And, you know, if there's some doubt or whatever. That, so that should be a tarbiyah for a student of knowledge. Uh, and a da'i, that they shouldn't have, you know, be quick to rush to answer every question, that they should ponder, reflect, that they should study. Also, you see that from a lot of the scholars. One thing, that's when I learned a lot of tarbiyah from Sheikh Ibrahim Raheli and Sheikh Suleiman Raheli, and they have different styles, and, and Sheikh Ubaidah Jabri and, and others. They all have different styles, and one thing I, I like about Sheikh Ibrahim Raheli and that I learned from him, you know, is like when he would get questions, you know, and sometimes people, they would misunderstand and it would come out in their questions and he would, you know, the way he would, he would uh, reflect before he would answer sometimes, like a computer. So it's like he'd process. He wouldn't always just jump, but he's very, he's much more reserved. He might stop and you see him looking up or, or, and then he'll start answering. Boom. He comes, kitab, wa sunnah, and, is, and starts giving it to you. And... Uh, Sheikh Suleiman Raheli is like a amazing computer, and so you see that he just leaves no stone untouched. It's just, um, you know, you see amazing things. And I failed to mention Imam Mukbil bin Hadi al Wadi, and at that time I didn't really know Arabic, and that was the beginning of my Talib al Ilm, and that was an incredibly high powered impact I'll never forget in my life. Meeting that Imam and watching him. Uh, and see, and and the, the 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 immense love for the book and the sunnah, and still even today, people joke. Uh, always, my colleagues at work and others, they because I say, "Well, Allahumma stan all the time. I got that from Imam Mukbel from his tarbiyah, that you know he had a sense of humor. He was amazing, and he was just an amazing lover and propagating propagator of 
uh, the Quran and the Sunnah and that tarbiyah of really going to the Nasus, abandoning Hizbiyah, you know, get, abandoning partners, uh, partisanship and that, no, it's not about me. It's not about, you know, a group or a sect or even your scholar, but it's about going back to the book and the Sunnah. And so you saw that rawness. I, I just never see, and even I would say I, I, I saw that with Yahya al-Hujuri in, in those early days, you know, because he used to teach more when I was in Damaj than Sheikh Mukhbil. And, uh, and you saw humility and you saw a love for the Sunnah, that they were just so serious because they didn't have all the trappings that you saw in Saudi Arabia. Just humble, humble thobes, imamas, and they were just, uh, just amazing. So that was amazing type of... Of educative effect and of going to the evidences you know going to the evidences and this is instilled and still been instilled in me even though I may have <laughs> very uh, you know uh, limited knowledge and so much shortcomings in practice uh, those are some of the gains that I gained from the religious scholars uh, could you name first three scholars we just did that and develop your understanding of Islamic knowledge in your opinion which is more beneficial studying by books or through religious scholars. Um, they're both very important, but of course, studying by scholars is, is much more important that, you know, the Salaf used to say that whoever's uh, book is his sheikh, then he is misguided. And so, and I remember Sheikh uh, Abu Salah al-Afghani, also he influenced me immensely in, um, in Saudi in Medina as well, visiting him. And... Um, he used to mention that ethar quite a bit, and that the importance of scholars is it's un you can't equate, and you can see this from students or people who are dais in the West, for example, or in other places, even in amongst the Arab world, who didn't have that silsila. They didn't study with scholars necessarily. Maybe they studied just degrees and they studied just from their books. You see that they make more mistakes and sometimes more errors in judgment than the one who has the tarbi of the ulama. It's, it's different. It's just different. And, uh, and I could go on and on and on and articulate for that uh, to you in many instances. And even there's certain scholars that the people put up in certain countries, and I don't want to mention names, but I know a particular scholar who refutes many people and he he's, he has knowledge. I'm, I I have many of I have many of his books. Any of his books I can get. I have his books, and I res, I enjoy his knowledge and taking from him. But you see, he doesn't have that silsila. He doesn't. If you look at his background, he studied, you know, and graduated from universities. His background is not even Islamic sciences necessarily, and he hasn't studied with ulama, even though he's Salafi. He's Salafi and he's respectable, but. You see, because because of that, I, I see shortcomings, and you can see this in some of his judgments and the way he talks about other individuals. And so my point being is that tarbi of the scholars and that connection with ulama, like my scholars that I mentioned, they all have connection to major scholars in this time. You know, these are all students of great imams in uh, that are well known, like Ben Baz and Al Albani and Ben Uthaymeen. And others, you know, alhamdulillah, I've had a chance to, you know, at least attend some lectures of Sheikh Rabi bin Hadi al Medhali in Mecca, when he lived in Mecca, just a few visits, and when he came to Medina, so I can't say that I had a lot of experience with him uh, as personally, as far as Tarbi and so forth, but he's a well-known Salafi scholar. Um... They are, why are they important? Why do I think they're important for a student of knowledge? Again, I said, uh, for that tarbiyah, for that educative effect, for the humbling. Hum, you know, they teach you to be humble when there are righteous scholars. And one thing I will say, there's also a difference that I've seen with the level of knowledge. When you see major scholars, like some of the scholars, mashallah, they have knowledge, but, you know, they have different levels. When you, you know, I have never really attended more than lectures with Imam Fozan, but I've met him personally on a couple occasions when he came to visit us in Hail at our university and otherwise. And you see a different effect also with Sheikh Abdul Masan al Abad. These Imams and Imam Mukbil and others, 
the kind of tarbiyah and the kind of effect that these imams do, you don't see that they get excited very easily. They deal with things a lot of times really just with knowledge, whereas you sometimes see younger scholars, they get, you know, excited more and they might, you know, name call some of them, you know, may Allah bless us and them, they may, you know, uh, they just have a different way because of the kind of tarbiyah that you see those elders, those elders and those major scholars, the way they answer questions and stuff is with strength. Like if you listen to Fozan, you know, his Arabic is easy to understand uh, He and he speaks for the general audience, you know, and he teaches for so even lay persons that know Arabic can sit in his durus. It's not always way out there for you know, a higher level for students of knowledge and stuff, but he teach, preaches teaches for everyone. And uh, and also he you see because of his level of knowledge, he's just like um, it's like a power punch. You know, it's just really the kind of uh, the level of knowledge and the the way they deal with questions. It's just different, and it's difficult for me to articulate and put it into language. So, same way with Imam Abdul Masin al Abad and Muhammad Mukhtar al Shankiti. These, you know, he's also like an ocean. When you ask those kind of Imams, you know, so they really inspire you to practice, and they inspire you to be humble, and they inspire you not to get caught up in controversies where you find some some younger scholars, and even some that are older in age, they have controversy around them all the time, and they're. You know, and they sometimes speak quicker and sometimes they make more mistakes, whereas you don't see that with a lot of the kibar or ulama, those major scholars. And so that's very important to sit with them and benefit from them. And they offer uh, many lessons. Uh, as far as the question, have you learned the Arabic language? I still need to learn Arabic language. I still need to advance my Arabic, but I've studied books and grammar and I've forgotten so much, but I still try to read and I teach on the YouTube and stuff, and this keeps me active in in the books by teaching. And so that's very important to teach what you know. Uh, do you think learning the Arabic language is important for a student of Islamic knowledge? I absolutely think it's necessary for someone to go to another level and to really be a teacher. Now, that doesn't mean that someone who doesn't know Arabic, because there's so much that's translated into English that people can teach many sciences and learn many sciences fairly well, but with the Arabic language, you're going to take things to a whole nother level and you're going to have access to things you will never have in English. And somebody mentioned about why don't they translate those major books uh, like, you know, completely Mijmua Fatawa and stuff. It wouldn't be because to even in the Arabic language, you need a certain high level of Arabic. You need a high level of knowing and understanding the mustalahat, the terminologies that are used. So Arabic is very important going back to your question. It's very, very important. Not all books that you can just go to. I have some books that are just references. I use them just as references, but it's not like I could read Mejmua Fatawa, <laughs> Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, and I would start issuing verdicts and stuff. I, I, you don't see the scholars teaching that except for to their special students. They might teach, you might have special durus behind closed doors teaching bits and pieces. You'll see the scholars teaching bits and pieces, but those books, there are certain books that are just references, and they're references for scholars. They're not for everyone to go into. So again, the Arabic language is a very important tool to really take it to another level and to be, uh, if someone's going to be a serious student of knowledge, they need it, in no matter what their cultural background. Is there anything else you would like to add? Uh, so much to say. But I think I'll, I've said so much and too much, and I know this is going to be difficult for you to transcribe. May Allah make it easy for you. May Allah bless us and you. May Allah bless us with a class with the bad and forgive us of our many sins. Um, a last point I probably want to make is the importance of for someone seeking knowledge to be consistent and to practice their knowledge and avoid fitna and controversy and and um, and being a source of fitna. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I said was correct, so I will Anything I said that was incorrect, so myself <clears throat> and the shaitan, wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad.